Um, so in order for that to um, I would probably want to do Lisa Leslie. Lisa Leslie. <laughs> Good choice. You take her. Hey, you take her. Put my money on champion, you. right there. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good. Go Dove. They did a, her parents did a tribute video to her as a surprise, just to show how proud they are mm. and excited for her for this moment. Yeah, I it was, I watched it this morning. I may or may not have cried a little bit. Um, it was beautiful. I'm super excited. You know, for and, her and, and just the that she had. you know what she has said, what she said with us there, and what she says in most all the interviews I see of her is work hard and have fun, right? Like it, maybe it's that simple. Maybe it's just that simple right. that, you know, there are complicating training, training regimens, there are plans, there are fitness, there's videos, there's a promotional team, there's all these things. Um, but in the end, work hard and have fun. Uh, and here she is, it's just, uh, it's sweet. Uh, and amazing. Super excited for her. Uh, so I think we have a few more trivia questions before we come back with our next guest speaker. We're back. I love seeing those uh, throwback names on the trivia. Not only did Ruthie mention a throwback name in Lisa Leslie, who I remember seeing at court uh, when I was a student, she played in Southern California, so it was great to see her. And then Cheryl Swoops listed there as the first draft pick in the WNBA. Uh, she played um, on some of those teams that kept uh, beating my New York Liberty from the Houston Comets all those years. So Ouch. she's definitely, definitely, definitely fierce. Uh, but those, uh, those Houston Comets were the nemesis uh, of the founding ladies of the New York Liberty. <laughs> I mean, it was a fun battle to watch though, I'm sure. For sure. For sure. Those, those, those original crews. So, uh, Watts, I think we're ready to shift to an interview for just me and our next guest. We'll let Sammy take 
um, a step away. And um, when we come back, we'll welcome Kyle Waters. Say hi to Kyle for me. I will. Kyle, there you are. Hello. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Well, we're, we're happy to have you. Um, for those in the audience, this is a, a, an alum of the Warsaw program, uh, a former student of ours, Kyle Waters. Kyle graduated from the University of Oregon in 2005, uh, and he currently serves as the Senior Vice President of Ticket Sales and Service for the three-time WNBA champ Seattle Storm. Um, we're happy to have you with us today, Kyle, to not only share your love for Oregon and, and talk about some ducks, um, you know, but to to just get your team side uh, about, you know, how, how does a team operate on a day like this? So so let's just start with that, that frame, which is you're responsible for, for ticket sales for a WNBA club. How do you and your team prepare for draft day? What sorts of marketing and promotions are you ready with in the can so that when the storm pick at number 11 tonight, you're ready to send messages to your fan base? Yeah, so with our organization, you know, we all have different roles. Um, so our basketball operations team, head coach, uh, GM, on that side of the business is all focused on the draft itself, right? And then we have a marketing team that spends a lot of effort on digital media and, you know, our Twitter account, Facebook. And that's where most of the activity is today for our organization is engaging with fans on social media and getting them excited about our draft pick. Um, typically, our ticket sales and service team would normally be making a lot of outbound phone calls right now, trying to get our fans excited, close some season ticket deals, uh, get group leaders excited about doing group outings for the opponents that were scheduled to play. But given the current situation with the pandemic, um, our ticket sales and service team is not outbound selling right now. Um, so instead, we're just kind of enjoying it alongside of the fans and waiting for when it's safe for us to play again and start selling tickets again. In the past, um, when, when business was operating as usual, um, what would you say the impact of who the pick is on the business? Is there a more generalized excitement about the next season? How much of it could be attributed to the actual player drafted? Yeah, like typically when the Storm has a number one draft pick, like we've had in the past, we had uh, Brianna Stewart as a number one pick, Sue Bird as a number one pick, um, Lauren Jackson in the past, uh, also Jewel Lloyd was a number one pick. When we have a number one pick in the draft, typically right after we make that pick, the phones start ringing off the hook. And so our ticket sales team normally works all morning, all day, all night, working the phones and, and computers and, and emails because when we have a top pick in the lottery, uh, the ticket sales just go, go crazy and also people purchasing online as well. So we have to make sure we have all of our ducks in a row with our e-commerce in advance typically. Um, as it relates to selling the other teams, the products that our fans are the most excited about are mini plans and also group outings to see star players. So for example, we're, we're projecting that we're going to sell out our game when we play the New York Liberty here in Seattle because we think so many ducks are going to travel to fill up our arena to see Sabrina. But we also think too that the other Oregon Ducks in the draft are going to give us big draws for mini plan purchases and group outings as well. Um, you know, we saw a lot of group outings when Seattle plays Las Vegas because so many Washington Huskies fans want to see Kelsey Plum. Um, so it's mm -hmm. a lot of it's group outings, um, fan bases wanting to see the superstar when they come to town. 
That's a great insight. Um, so you've been involved with the storm now to some degree for a, a running total of almost 13 seasons. Um, I'm just curious about, you know, when you when you pull back a little bit after 13 years, what are what are your thoughts on the arc of the WNBA, the arc of professional women's sports and and how far has it come in your market and what are the opportunities in the future? But you're just one of the, the few folks who have been around it for a really long time. So I'm interested in your sort of overall thoughts on uh, the trajectory of, of women's professional basketball. Yeah, I spent four years as a ticket sales agent and now nine years in management and ticket sales and service. And what I found is that we've continued to grow over time. Like over the last five years, our paid ticket attendance is up 10% versus what it was five years ago. And also our revenue in paid tickets is up 20% versus where it was five years ago. Our organizational revenue over the last five years is up 67%. And it's primarily because of sponsorships, because when the uh, WNBA started selling the, uh, the jersey, that was a huge game changer for our financials. So we have two, we have two marquee partners, uh, Swedish and also Symmetra, and those sponsorship deals are enormous. And so that's been a big um, boost to our league over the last five years. Also, our TV viewership is up as well. Our, our TV viewership was up 49% last year thanks to ESPN, ABC, our new deal with CBS Sports Network. We also have a, um, a new deal with Joe TV here in Seattle, which is our Fox affiliate, that they televise all of our home games that are not on ESPN, ABC, or CBS Sports Network. Um, and also the, uh, the engagement with digital media, like social media has been up enormously. Um, we had over 5 million video views last year on social, and that continues to be growing significantly. Interesting, it's to the website have gone down. So there seems to be in our industry less visits directly to the homepage and more people just engaging and interacting on social media instead without even visiting our website, which is uh, quite interesting as well. Interesting. I, you know, one of these things that we talk about a lot in our program with students is, is this virtuous cycle of, of the revenue that comes from commercialization and then the ability to invest that back into the enterprise. And, and there have been, there's been lots of talk around women's sport for a long time that one of the one of the pieces of the engine that's needed to make sure that women's sports continues to progress and take the next step are those outside dollars from corporate. So um, if we can if we can read into the storm case study that that there is corporate interest, that there's broadcast interest, that that virtuous cycle uh, of getting those external investments um, seems to be putting everybody on a, on a more sustainable growth path. Yeah, a new trend as well in our industry has been community relations being partnered with corporate partnerships and most of the way the business is operated. I remember in the past, like in 2005, when I first started in sports working for the Supersonics and the Storm, those were two entirely different departments operating in, you know, in two different ways, going two different directions. Now, um, we have at the Storm a senior vice president of corporate partnerships and social responsibility, and it's very important to our corporate partners that their dollars that they're investing with the Storm are going towards giving back to the community mm -hmm. in the um, form of basketball camps and you know um, being role models for young kids. And so much of the corporate partnership dollars we're getting is not even as much about eyeballs on our product, but even more so about what can we do as partners in the community to make a big impact using the storm as a vehicle to drive like a bigger influence based on what those corporate uh, organizations are trying to accomplish. So that, that's been a trend over the last 
five years, I'd say that's also increased our revenue. That's great. And I, I think I, I've seen over time a lot of articles written about about female fans in particular and their interest in this convergence between the team and community and that female fans uh, have heightened interest when it comes to understanding what the team and its business partners are doing to Im improve the community where people work and play. And so that seems like a really natural fit for a women's organization um, with a, a passionate female fan base. Uh, we had a question for you from Justin Carpenter, and he was just interested in um, if you could give a top level overview of uh, your fan base, meaning sort of some of the demographics or fan profile categories, and then where do you think there's opportunity to grow the fan base to new kinds of fan profiles in the greater Seattle area? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've definitely found that during my experience over the last 10 years working for the storm, our fan base has grown to be more diverse. Um, you know, I think in general, just general statements, more than 50% of our fan base is female. Um, the age range typically ranges between like 40 to 60, I think, on just the average age, general age range of our fans. So the stereotypical, you know, WNBA fan has been female between 40 to 60 years of age. Um, but where we seem to be growing and have the biggest opportunity growth is with the younger fan base, like in between the 20s to 40s. Because, for example, the Storm is going into its 21st season. And so now we're finally at a place in time that the children that grew up with the WNBA are now like in their 20s to 30s. And they're more accepting of women playing sports and it's kind of more trendy and cool and it's what they grew up with versus you know when i first started out selling in 2005 i'd be calling older male sports fans that thought women's sports was not cool or like not as interesting so we progressed a lot in the last like you know 10 15 years and now i think this younger fan base is on its way and like i've got a lot of younger professionals that are in their 20s to 30s that are making pretty good money at Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks, these companies here in Seattle, and they're dropping thousands of dollars on courtside season tickets because they think it's cool. And I think the more and more we have those people coming in and following us, they're, they're trendsetters. And I think others are going to follow as well. And that's why I think we're seeing growth in women's sports. And and as we get deeper into the first round, I'm going to see like the practicality of what player we're going to take off of the board based on who's best available to suit our needs. But the way the WNBA is, is like if you're not like a pick in the first six or seven picks in that first round, I mean, there, there's no certainty that you'll even make the team. You know, that player is going to have to fight for a position and training camp and the storm's coming back with a fully loaded roster. Uh, yes. So, yes. so for me, with that first round pick, I'm going to see like the practicality and the rationale of it, but it won't be as emotional as the earlier part of the first round, seeing these uh, big game changer draft picks that could even be starting for their teams next year. Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight. I I, I think. I think in sport in general, not everyone understands that, you know, getting your name called on draft night, it's not always a direct line to to the starting lineup or even or even dressing for a game. So I think that's a great insight, Kyle. So um, I've got our closing question for you, which he, we have been asking everybody today and we will keep asking everyone else. And that is Kyle Waters. If you had the opportunity to play a game of horse, old school playground style in the driveway with any WNBA hero from any era, who would you want to play playground ball with? I think I would want to play against Diana Taurasi uh, because she's so competitive and has like so much spirit and she's a legend. I think that um, 
that would be like a wild and crazy experience because she just like brings like such an edge to the game that I could only imagine the sort of trash talk and and the <laughs> swag that she would bring to it. So I think Tarasi would be the most entertaining to play against because she's uh, so unique that way. Yes, yes, she has been a popular answer today. I'll check with our back of house statisticians, but I think she's the leading vote getter so far today. Well, Kyle, um, I just thank you for, for joining us. Your expertise has really been important in this conversation and um, the Warsaw Center is proud of you. We're, we're proud to have a, a team executive in the WNBA who's, who's helping continue to, to lead that league forward. Um, we hope that there will be some uh, matchups up, up in Seattle uh, with some former Ducks on the roster and I'll volunteer to lead uh, from Eugene Duck Caravan up the nickel myself to make sure we're up there to, uh, to celebrate um, Oregon and, and the power of women's sport. So thanks, Kyle. Congratulations on everything. Enjoy the night and uh, go Ducks. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Go Ducks. Thank you. All right, everybody out there on the stream, we are going to take a stretch break here. Uh, we will come back with our next guest at 2.40. Um, we know there's a little bit of buffering lag at some times with the stream, but keep with us. We've got amazing guests coming up in the second half of our show. We'll see you at 2.40. Thanks, everybody.
Hi, Wit. The screen said dance break. Did you dance, Sammy? I did. I was, you know, just doing a little bit of this in my seat for a while. Yeah. What good about stretch. You? Good stretch. Good stretching. <laughs> yeah, I definitely was able to stand up a little bit. Use my wobbly legs. Um, are you ready this for another This has been set? so fun. I'm having so much fun. Are you having fun? I I'm am having fun. too. I am just nerding out the entire time, just trying to hold the excitement within. It's been so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good. It's been good. So uh, who do we have on deck, Sammy? So next we have uh, Madison Ornstill. Um, she's been with Adidas for almost seven years now. She's currently the global sports marketing team, um, works on this global sports marketing team um, for women's basketball. Um, prior to her current role, she worked with Adidas footwear creation teams on projects like D. Lillard 1, J. Wall 1, and D. Rose 5. So everybody, please welcome Madison Ornstill. Hi, Madison. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh, you've got an awesome backdrop there. I love oh, it. I will say it's definitely um, all made for this, but I am super excited for today. I'm super excited for the draft, and I just wanted to commend you guys because truly it's an honor to be here, but also really great to see women's sports being highlighted and getting the attention it deserves. So much appreciated. Yes, to you well, too. Well, thank Back you. You're, exactly. You're the one helping us make this happen, so thank you so much. Um, so oh, we actually God. got a lot of – questions um from social media for you um i thought you know we have about uh -oh. 15 minutes with you oh no they're great they're great questions um <laughs> we have about 15 minutes with you so i wanted to just dive in and get started with the fun cool let's do it all right all right so from a barton five she asks what made you get into the industry what's the biggest difference slash obstacle in recruiting given the current social distancing climate yeah, I think um, my story into the industry is a little bit long, so I'll try to be short with it. Um, I never thought that I'd be working in women's sports. I was a big basketball fan growing up. I'm from the Bay, the Warriors were bad, um, but my dad played basketball in college, and we just grew up um, watching the Warriors, going to games, being on that journey. Um, then I moved to Chicago, and it was when Derrick Rose and won MVP. So um, was like introduced to Adidas at that time, and just like basketball was everything in Chicago. If you if you know that, um, my mom was always pushing me to watch sports because I played soccer my whole life. Um, but I was that girl that didn't understand um, the beauty of it. I was like, no, mom, they're not good. Um, which is funny to say now because now I. I'm the leader for women's basketball at Adidas and super passionate about it. Um, my journey really started in women's sports in 2017 when uh, Adidas kind of looked up and realized, oh, we only have Candace Parker on our roster and the time is trying to change. And I was on the sports marketing team and it just seemed fitting because I did have that experience you talked about on on the business side. So how do we grow that women's business? And since then, never looked back. It's been the best decision um, that has ever happened to me. Uh, something that I fell into. And now I think we're on the forefront of such positive change and being part of the group, like both of you guys that are kind of um, shifting the, the industry, shifting the culture around the industry and shifting the narrative is something that um, couldn't be happier about, especially, you know, today I think is a, is a really special day. And I'm really excited for the league to um, kind of also be pioneers in this weird time. Like you said, it is a very weird time. And obviously things are different. Um, you've had some great speakers so far, people that I constantly am working with, like Lindsay or Carol. Um, and it's just like they said, we always work harder and we always work smarter, smarter in this industry. And so it's just about, um, kind of leveling up, knowing that uh, this isn't just a one day thing or a one day process. We've been recruiting the last four years, or in some cases, three years. We've been with these players at McDonald's through their AAU career. So it's just maintaining that conversation and just being true to who they are and who we are as a brand and who they are as people and who I am as a person. I love that. I love how your story I is, I feel like it's very unique to women in sports, right? Where you are starting off just having just love for the game and then finding yourself with that realizing that you have an opportunity to really 
stand up and advocate for women in the space. I think it's awesome. Um, so with that, we have another question. Whether it's over the phone. Whether amazing, amazing. I'm sure you're so excited. So is your team for today. Um, especially with the yeah. two athletes that, you know, are currently at Adidas schools or coming from Adidas schools. So we have another question for you um, from Ash115 with individual players representing their own personal unique brand. How often do you integrate Adidas lifestyle products in addition to athlete shoes and apparel? And what benefits does this present for both product lines? You know, I think Adidas is in a really unique position because we do live in that intersection between sport and culture. I mean, we are very authentic on the floor. So we had one of the, you know, the superstar just came out with one of the basketball shoes, right? Um, like it relaunched this year, 55th anniversary, or I couldn't, my brand speak is not, we've been out of the office for a month and a half. But we also, <laughs> you know, we have that last, at this time I was at Coachella with, um, Liz Cambage and Candace Parker. So we have that ability to really play in that intersection. And we also are the, the brand for the creators. So it's really my job when I'm looking at the portfolio um, to find women who are a creator on and off the court. And the art is just as important to me. I want my players to be multifaceted. Um, if you look at our roster, no one is just a basketball player so you see people like Neka Gumake, who's the president of the players association angel yeah. mccautry she owns her own ice cream shop she does camps in africa liz can unfortunately fortunately we have those players to do that so i'm glad that you know you're able to recognize that amazing so i have one last um question for you before i think whitney has a question for you after that um, we have a question from Jay Carpenter 25. I'm wondering what your portfolio of women basketball players look like. And if you have given thought to designing a shoe around one of these female athletes, and do you envision this would be someone that is already signed with Adidas or one you're looking to sign this year? Look, I'm obviously biased, right? I think we have the best portfolio in the game. Um, but I have to think that, right? It's my job to think that. It's my job to celebrate them. Um, in terms of what we look for in players, like I said, we look for true creators on and off the court. Um, and I do think that we do are positioning ourselves to market them to be signature athletes, icon athletes. That being said, you really just have to listen to the market. Um, this is a business and um, I'm not the one in charge of making that decision, right? So how this works is the, actually the people who, the retailers are the ones um, that kind of make that decision. If they come to our brand, we have a need for a signature shoe, then we're gonna deliver upon that. Um, and we're gonna make sure it's my job that to ensure the players that can support that product. I believe that we do. I think the team believes that we do. Um, and I think if you look across all brands right now, we're all just trying to figure out what's right. Um, I think now more than ever is a time where women are not necessarily looking, like uh, feminism to me necess isn't necessarily being the best woman at something. I just want to be the best. And if I, I just happen to be a woman. So maybe looking at shoes and it's, I just want the best basketball shoe. I care if Damian Lillard wears it or Sparker wears it. I just want to wear it because it's the best and the best players are wearing it and it aligns with my value. So we're continuing to find that happy medium um, to what the market asks for, but also push women's sports and women's marketing. Amazing. Whitney, it sounds like you and I need to start going out and signing petitions. Um, to drive that, right. you know, market demand. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm fired up. Madison, I'm fired up. Um, so I, I, I have a, I have, <laughs> have a couple of questions here. Um, as we get to the end of our time, you know, you spoke really eloquently about the Adidas brand and finding athletes and platforms that, that speak to the Adidas brand. Um, but you're in a partnership with the league. And so I'm just curious about, um, you know, if you could just share with the audience, what, how is it that you in your role interact with the WNBA? What are your thoughts on where the league is going from a marketing perspective? Uh, they have a relatively new commissioner who came from accounting and not sport. 
um, just talk about how important it is to have some congruence with the league's vision and how the league's developing its brand and and what the value of that partnership brings to the company. Yeah, I think that's a great question and a great point. We only have a partnership with the league, but we also have partnerships with specific teams as well. So one of our marquee partnerships is with the LA Sparks, especially because we have four players on that team. Um, we'll be remiss to say if we don't have a relationship with the Players Association, considering we have the president, president is craving sport right now. She's truly a pioneer, and though she doesn't necessarily come from sport, but you know, she is very authentic, and I think you'll continue mm -hmm. to see that with Kathy. Yeah, that's great. Um, it, it's just, it's just again the 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 arc of the development. I just don't want to be lost on people that that tonight is amazing, and the state of the game is amazing, and the investment that these big brands are making in this space is amazing. Um, and it came from lots of shoulders before us, right? And and mm -hmm. we're all we're all yeah. in the big arc together. Um, so you know there are still yeah. challenges. If you if you had a magic wand and said, you know what, this job would be a lot easier if, you know, what kinds of things do we need removed that are challenges? What kind of inputs do you really need that you don't have? What what are the things that would really help you take your efforts to the next level? Um, I just think it is a really tough question, right? And what you said before is we're all all in this together. I think that um, be outside with their families tonight, um, then watch the draft. You know, 25 degrees in Portland. What are you doing? Um, but your your audience ship counts. It count your dollar counts towards um, future investment of this league. I think it's that. It's also just finding the balance between the business and what's. Um, it's kind of that same argument: chicken or the egg. Do you put money in um, to try to to see it grow or do you, does it need to make money and then you add more money if that makes sense um yes yes it, we just need to decide we just need to decide as an industry we just need um i think this year's super bowl commercial telling you saw so many women's ads in the super bowl commercial those brands choosing to target women then but then not support the WNBA is very interesting to me. So I think that will also need to shift in order for this brand to truly grow. This brand is yes. well, not Adidas. Yes, yes. I mean, you're right. There, there has been for a long time in women's sport a bit of a gap between people feeling the feels, right? I want to support this. I believe in play a game of horse with any WNBA hero from any era. It was just you and another baller in the driveway. Who would you want to play with? Look, I'm really fortunate to get to shoot around with a lot of um, current players kind of when I want at my discretion just because of the nature of my job. Um, and I've thought about this. And I will say, um, if I could play horse with it, it'd be Gigi Bryant. I'm super... Um, I'm looking forward to tonight. She will be drafted. So she is a WNBA player um, after tonight. And she was a true pioneer um, of this game. And her legacy, I think, was a shining light and will continue to be a shining light despite the tragedy. I have never met her. And I would have lo loved a chance to just pick her brain because I know that what she had um, in store for this league and this game was special. And um, that's kind of who I would want to spend a horse game with and I'm really looking forward to to watching her get drafted watching all the U of O players get drafted uh, I think it's a really special night amazing amazing there's nothing to say after that amazing thanks <laughs> for joining us Madison Tarasi. we know uh, favorite. we know it's uh, <laughs> another Tarasi vote um it's been great to have you we know you're busy uh thank you for contributing your very important voice and for doing what you're doing for the business. Uh, we thanks so much and uh, enjoy the show tonight. Yeah, too. Thank you, I Madison. I can't say go Ducks, but you know, you know it's <laughs> down there somewhere. We won't make you. It's it's honorary now. We'll pay we it for you. you. We'll pay it for you. Go Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Madison. Bye.
Oh man, that you know, great. Sammy, I'm a cr I'm a crier as it is. I'm a crier, and so when they draft same. Gigi tonight, uh, same, same, amazing. Yeah, I'm gonna lose it for sure. That's my OC <laughs> girl right there. Um, well, I well, think uh, we we've have... got someone in the queue, Sammy. So you're up. Quite the guy, if I should say so myself. Um, everybody, our next guest has been Oregon women's basketball head coach since 2014. Um, he led his team last year all the way to the final four, um, at last year's NCAA tournament. Call me bias, but if this year's tournament wasn't canceled, they would have taken the title for sure. Um, please welcome the coach of this year's Pac-12 conference champs. Coach Pretty dialed in. This is a big deal. They're making it a big deal. Uh, since they don't have a, the live stage to walk across, they're trying to make this as special as possible for them. So I think they've got Satu kind of running around a little bit. Uh, she didn't have time to talk, so I just told Niara. I, I, I have to speak to Ruthie, too, and she looks so great. She was so excited. Yeah. I'm sure you're just like a very proud coach today, um, among other things. Uh, well, I sure am. It's is uh, you know the culmination of a great career. Uh, I, I think you know after tonight we can kind of close the book on this season. I think it's still open to some degree, and we're still thinking about what if, what if, what if, and and we'll always have that to some degree. But um, you know, I think tonight kind of ends a chapter. You know that that chapter. They they now can move on. So when when people need to uh, get hold of those. Uh, you know, all of them, they don't have to call me to get their phone numbers. Or, you know, I should say, go through their agent. I'm done. And, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of a cool deal. It's like a parent handing them off to, uh, you know, to, to someone else. So, uh, but I'm really proud of them. I know this is a dream come true for all of them. And, and what a night for Oregon basketball. I, I think, you know, this is uh, pretty special. It's never been done before. Who knows if it'll ever be done again. Uh, but this is uh, this is a pretty special night. I mean, this goes into testament. Yeah, you know, one of the of one of the things we've been go for it, Winnie. You know, one of the the things we've been talking about all afternoon, Coach, is 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 the legacy and the arc, right? And this certainly is a magical moment in time. Uh, and and this started four or five years ago when you came to Eugene, but it started before that too. Uh, and that that there is a long journey of of women's basketball in Eugene, of of the ascent of women's sports within the intercollegiate athletic system. Um, and it's the end of a chapter tonight, but the next one begins. And so we'd just love to hear you sort of talk bigger picture about about the the big arc and the rise up of of women's basketball in this country and and how you've seen it grow at the collegiate yes. level and and some thoughts about the future of the sport well you know i think it's unfortunate everything that happened and and you know i along with everybody else feels the same way uh you know sports in the in the grand scheme of things it's important to us but it's not you know, life and death, like we're, we're seeing uh, being experienced right now with the coronavirus and people's livelihoods and, and on and on. So I, I truly get it. I understand the decision. It's just too bad we didn't get to see this play out. And I'm not just talking about our team. I'm talking about the crescendo that, that would have been the NCAA tournament this year. I, I talked with Carol Stiff from ESPN. We talk actually quite often. And, uh, you know, she they were anticipating, especially with the the ex, the uh, expanded platform for for the tournament, they were expecting the biggest numbers in the history of the NCAA tournament for women's basketball. I think we um, it, it's off the charts. Uh, this 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 group was at the forefront of this explosion that we're seeing in women's sports, you know, from the from the national soccer team to really Oregon women's basketball, with all due respect to everybody else that would have been in the tournament. Nobody was going to beat us. I mean, I, I just feel that way. We were too driven. We were too experienced. We had too much talent. And we had a couple of special players, one in particular, Sabrina, that just was not going to let us lose. It was That would not have uh, been an option. And so I, I think we all missed out on a special moment, that wave or whatever you, you referred to it as. Um, I, I think it would have reached a, a brand new height. 
in uh, in April. Yes, yes. Sammy, I think you have some questions that came in from. Yes, I have one from Mike Rod 22. Girls drop out of sports at a relatively early age. What can community coaches and parents do to better support their girls to continue playing sports? Well, I, when I talk to young coaches, I always tell them, you know, teach them the game, don't teach them plays. I, I think one of the the downsides of, of women's basketball in general is, you know, the, the way you learn how to play any sport, and let's just take basketball, for instance, is you just go play. You get out on the playground and you play. You make up your own rules, your own teams. But unfortunately, girls don't do that. When was the last time you saw five on five girls, you know, and uh, and they're, you know, and they'll be there. You know, uh, that's just kind of the way they are. So I always say, you know, to young coaches, just let them play. Teach them how to play. You know, give them some principles and let them govern themselves. I think that's critical instead of just really teaching them how to play or the plays. And then secondly, have fun. I, I just think we all take this thing way too seriously. And at a young age, <laughs> girls and boys, you know, we're keeping one loss records in third grade. Who's playing the game and respecting the game? Um, so I, I think that's it. Really, you know, uh, be into it. Teach them the fundamentals. Teach them the, the game. Let them play and, and have fun at it. And and I, I wish that more people would stay involved. Hey, listen, it's not just girls that are dropping out. It's boys that are dropping out early, too. <laughs> oh my you know God. what I mean? Yes. I, I just, I wanna, you know, I it's like you. a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> we should schedule that for you, Coach. I think that'd be a great. Yeah, that'll be know, our that'll be our next YouTube yeah. live show. You, Your community you catch engagement me at the wrong engagement. moment. You catch me at the wrong <laughs> moment or the right moment, however you want to <laughs> phrase it, and I'll be there. And and, and it may happen. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Sammy, um, you have a couple more? Have, yeah, we have um, one more from YouTube. Um, Alex Webb asks, would you rather see your players play against each other or on the same team once they enter the WNBA? That's a great question, and I've been asked that, uh, you know, because a, a bunch since New York moved up to the nine slot in the first round. You know, yeah. what's the possibility of Sabrina and Ruthie? I'll tell you, there's, there's a good side and a bad side. Um, and and I'll do this trying to be as sensitive as I can. Um, let's say, uh, you know, obviously we know the magic that Sabrina and, and Ruthie have had together. So let's say they both play at New York. I think that's great. The synergy is amazing. Uh, they're going to be way ahead of the game. At the same time, on the, the attention is going to be placed on Sabrina because she's the number one pick. Ruthie would be kind of in the background, you know, and she's not that she's been in the background here. Uh, but she's played a, uh, when it, when it comes to attention and stuff like that, kind of a secondary role, you know, to Sabrina and to see that play itself out again, uh, in the pros, you know, is, um, you know, would be unfortunate to some degree, if that makes sense. I, I hope you kind of understand. I, I would love nothing more than that to happen, but I, I can just see how the media works. That would be the, uh, the narrative, um, if she went, let's say, at number eight and a former player of mine, Courtney Vandersloot, who until Sabrina came along was maybe considered her and Sue Bird the greatest point guards of all time. Um, I know she has been lobbying her general manager, who's also her coach and her Russian coach, to draft Ruthie. I mean, she watched pretty much every game we played this year. She wants Ruthie. Mm -hmm. and, and Courtney has guaranteed me that Ruthie does not get past eight tonight. So, you know, if that's the case, then she'd be in great hands. You know, Courtney is one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, her and, and her wife, Allie Quigley, I know would be great mentors for, for Ruthie, and she'd be in a great situation and, quite frankly, on a better team, you know, in the first year, you know, the, the sky or, can, or playoff contenders. So, um, yeah. so I would, and then Ruthie gets to be her own person, you know. Uh, if I had my way, I would love all three of them to be drafted by the same team. Now that would be something. And uh, you know, the, <laughs> the scenario that people, the scenario people don't talk about, they talk Ruthie and Sabrina on the same team, but there's a chance that with Satu going too, that Dallas with their second pick, at, I don't know, I yes. think they're at five, 
good pickup, Ruthie. Mm-hmm. So there's a, you know, because everybody wanted them to, or thought at, initially they were going to get Lauren Cox because of the local deal. So they obviously need someone in the middle. And why not Ruthie there? So it could be a possibility of having Satu and Ruthie on the same same team. I don't think many people are talking about that. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I, um, that would be incredible. We have another fan question. Uh, Megan Kelch uh, reached out to us from YouTube and asking, knowing each of them, um, knowing each of your players, Sabrina, Ruthie, and Satu so well, um, how do you – what are you most excited for as they build their own personal brand outside of UO? Well, that whatever they do, uh, what I'm excited about, it will always be linked to the University of Oregon. Um, they'll be ducks and uh, through and through. So when they have successes, uh, you know, that comes along with it. And I think that's really special that we'll always be linked with those three incredible players. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I think they all have an opportunity to be special. Uh, Sabrina, it's obvious, you know, she's, um, uh, perhaps the highest profiled women's basketball player, uh, to leave college, you know, in the last, I don't know how many years. I mean, Brianna Stewart, perhaps, uh, before that it might've been Tarasi. I'm not sure, but, and she's going to the, you know, to New York. I mean, she couldn't have gone to a better market in terms of marketability. And with, uh, yeah. you know, her, I know which shoes she's going with. I don't know if but with that machine behind that, behind them, it's going to be incredible. So, um, you know, and then Satu, I, I think Satu's upside, uh, what I always hear from general managers and coaches is her, her potential. Uh, she's got a potential to be a, a multi-time all-star and the face of the league. I, I truly do believe that. Uh, I think at some point she's going to have a shot at being the, the chancellor of Germany, you know, and take over for Chancellor <laughs> Merkel. I mean, she's that she's that smart, that intelligent, that social, that, that talented of a person to do that. And then Ruthie, you know, I, I think has got a chance to be considered a, a great inside player, a post player, just because of her hard work, her charisma, that smile, uh, her willingness to be a great team player. I think they all three have different strengths that could really lend them to be important pieces of, of the WNBA, you know, uh, and, and faces of their, their uh, respective organizations and, and partly the league. It's, it's so exciting as a, a longtime Duck fan to think about, you know, the faces of the league at the highest level of basketball in the world to, to be from our community and our campus. It is, it is a deeply humbling and proud feeling um, that those representatives of the next phase of basketball, those are our people. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing mm-hmm. feeling. So, Coach, we just have two quick closing questions so you can get back on your yeah. celebration tour. I, I never give quick um, answers, the, so they might be quick questions, <laughs> we don't want but I them. go on and on. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, we don't want them. We don't want them. Um, so what's the future here? We've talked about the future of, of these four athletes in the WNBA. Uh, there's more Oregon women's basketball to come. So what can we look forward to um, as Duck fans? And, and how do you think about um, the future for your program? Well, make no mistake about it. The, the Ducks aren't going away. We're, we're going to be a national contender, um, you know, in the, in the future that I see. Um, but also, there will never be another team like this, ever. Um, you know, they were the first. And I know we've had really great teams here in, in the past, and, and th- I get that, but not like this. This was special, and we might have teams that, uh, that come after that win more games and championships and, and national championships, perhaps. But this team will always be remembered as, uh, as the one that left that legacy. Uh, they filled stadiums. They uh, were, were the, the talk of college basketball nationwide. Uh, you know the 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 U.S. USA victory, the the three Pac-12 championships, the the just the way that we ran offense. You know, uh, a historically great offense 
that, that we've seen the last few years that, that may not be duplicated. I, I look at our points per 100 possessions was 123.5 this year. Historically good. I mean, it, it's incredible. The best men's team this year was 118, and the best NBA teams, 116. So we're better than any basketball team in the country at any level in offensive proficient efficiency. So all those things combined and just uh, what they did uh, for Matthew Knight Arena and our community and, and mm -hmm. university, I, I think will be a legacy that you know can't be matched. That being said, we're going to be loaded next year. We'll be young, but we're <laughs> going to be loaded. And the veterans we do have back are great leaders. They know how to win. Um, so, you know, it might not be 40 point blowouts every night, like we've kind of seen, but <laughs> it, it, you know, this is, this is going to be a fun group to watch grow up. And, uh, and again, yeah. Yeah. I think do similar things to, um, you know, to this last group. Amazing. Amazing. Well, our official closing question is the same closing question okay. we've given to everybody this afternoon. And that is Kelly Graves. If you had the opportunity to play a game of horse, old school driveway style with any WNBA hero from any era, who would you want to play with? Well, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> listen, my favorite player in the WNBA, and I'll be very uh, politically correct here. My favorite player is Courtney Vandersloot. And, uh, Maite is a close second, uh, but uh, but Courtney was the one that really got me on the national map as a coach. You know, I was some fledgling little knucklehead that didn't know anything, and and she came along and and uh, taught me a lot about coaching and about uh, relationships and things like that. And I I just uh, follow her with a passion and and just love her to death. So Courtney, plus I know I could beat her. In a, in a, uh, in a uh -huh. I, so I now we have two follow-up shows. Way. We have two follow-up shows. We have Courtney V. Kelly as our next YouTube live. Yeah. And then we have coach Graves bombing some accounting firm to look over someone's shoulder at a PL <laughs> and tell them how they're doing it wrong. So yes, more, right. more content Those coming be... with coach Graves. Yes. Yes. Now you asked Sabrina Excellent. and, uh, Satu and Courtney who beats them in a game of horse and, Right here. They know. They know better than to, well. to challenge me. <laughs> we are so thankful for your time and your candor and everything that you've contributed to our U of O community. We're proud of you. We're grateful. We're happy to celebrate Thank what you. everyone has accomplished tonight. Thanks for your time. Go Ducks, Coach. Yeah. Yeah. Go Thank Ducks. you. Go, yeah. Go Ducks. Hey, let's enjoy tonight, man. What a what a thrill for all of us. This is awesome. So fun. See you. So fun. Okay. Thanks so much. Right. Thank bye you, bye. Coach. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That was incredible. This, that was incredible. How do I, I don't know, can I fill water bottles or wash towels or <sighs> can I do something to be part of that? Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll be one of the kids wiping down the court, please. Like I'll sign me up. Just yeah. get me a rag, get me a cleaner. We're good to go. Um, I was hoping he was going to spill the beans on the shoe for Sabs. I know. I, I mean, I, I sort of was, but I then was I didn't want it. I didn't want to be the, the source of trouble. I didn't want to get a whole bunch of cease and desist letters yeah. in our YouTube chat because we busted something. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't gonna pry, but I was definitely leaning forward in my seat, like, <laughs> really hoping there was some type of slip. Anyways, that was hilarious. Yeah. So Whitney, Amazing. so far, Amazing. what's been a break? So far on this show, what's been your favorite moment? Oh my gosh. Well, I thought uh, I, that's a very hard question. Um, I thought I Madison was bringing the fire from Adidas. I thought she just was so bright and present and she knows exactly what she stands for she knows exactly what her brand stands for she knows exactly the mission of lifting up female athletes and um i thought she was fantastic but yeah she was pretty awesome and just seeing her 
just the impact that they are having as a brand on these athletes and women in sport as a whole, just so impressive. And it's so excited to see that they have so much planned um, in the near future for us. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another thing I think that everybody brought up to some degree in their own way, which I also thought about listening to Madison when she said shifting culture and shifting narrative um, and something that the the sport people have also mentioned is sort of, you know, how how do girls and women engage in sport? Coach Graves said, you know, you don't see girls just go to the playground and play pickup ball. They they are sort of waiting, waiting to be invited, waiting to be welcomed, waiting yeah. to be told, okay, here you come, and here are the rules, and and we collectively, we have, we have waited for a long time. We've been, we have waited to be invited. We have waited to have been given permission to step forward. Um, and that time is over and, and to just go for it and to not look over and make sure it's okay, right? That you just go, you just pick up a ball and you play and you just go to school and you learn and you just do. Um, and you know that that was a marketing thread that was a basketball thread um mm -hmm. that that we're just stepping forward and we're not waiting to be told it's okay we're not waiting um to be invited we're just gonna show up and do exactly being fearless and you know if you don't there was this quote that i saw a while ago and it was if there's not a seat for you at the table bring up your like bring your own lawn chair like there was something about yeah. that lines about like there's no longer you don't need to be waiting for an invite you just need to push forward um and stay resilient and stay active and true to what you want you know for your future just despite you know what i mean like different differences and inequalities that we you know as a culture unfortunately face at times yeah you know and the work right that's what ruthie said ruthie said two things work hard and have fun um and and this is not this is not given to anyone this is earned and so we just hustle for it you know and we don't ask permission and we don't wait and we hustle and we write our own script as it evolves we don't wait for the script to be written um and there's just more openness to that than there's ever been and to see these young women um you know, both Madison and Ruthie, they're the future and, you know, they're, they're just doing it with strength and confidence and that's inspiring. Well, on that note, I think it's time for a little bit of a stretch break. Um, we will be back at 3.40 um, for our final guests before the ESPN draft. Everybody, please make sure you're still tuning in. Um, we have Still to announce our um, top 10 WNBA draft picks at the end of the first round at ESPN's broadcast. So we will we will be back um, at 3.40 and then we'll talk some more and prime you again to make sure that you're still tuning in um, during the ESPN draft. All right. See you guys soon.